Hey everybody, I'm Dane Sanders and I want to welcome you to Fast Track Coaching. This is episode 117 or 18, I think, and uh, we're in for a treat today. Uh, I'll get to that in just a moment, but if you're brand new to Fast Track Coaching, I want to get your help you get your bearings very quickly. The first thing is, this is a, a short conversation. We're only going to be on the phone for about 30, 45 minutes, and it's really meant to be a kind of a coffee conversation where me and my guests, we get a chance to chat and invite you into that conversation. and the purpose of it is really simple. We want to help you move your creativity and your business forward just a little bit this week. Uh, your goal should be to, to hear and listen and learn a couple things, one, two, or three things that you can take away from this and actually implement in your business, in your creativity, in your thinking, and, uh, and progress forward. Uh, that's what we're all trying to do is we raise the bar for the whole industry. And I think today will be a treat. The way to participate is you can ask questions. There's a couple ways to do that. One is if you're in the chat room, many of you guys are already in there. Uh, for the live event, um, you can be asking questions and that sort of thing. But just keep in mind that if you only ask questions in the chat room when it's a recorded event later on, and a lot of folks watch these after the fact um, on the replay, uh, we won't be able to have that captured. So the best way to participate is to actually uh, click on the little light bulb in the lower right hand corner of your screen after you've joined the event. And there's a little, and when you hover over it, it'll say questions. When you click on it, you can actually type in your questions. We'll pull that on screen during the, the live event and ask your questions early because it tends to be that people don't ask questions at the beginning and then they all start asking all at once and then we can't have everyone on. Uh, and with today's guest, I have a hunch there'll be a lot of great dialogue and I want to encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, and of course, if you the third way to get involved is if you put at Dane Sanders or pound fast track as a hashtag in um, and something to do with Twitter, we will be tracking that. And if we're able to pick it up and uh, get to those questions, we will. But the first priority will always be the light bulb questions. So that's it for now. Um, we will uh, move on. Uh, Rob, Shirley, uh, Sherry, I see that you're making fun of me that I'm so organized with everything, but I can't remember what the exact episode number I'm on. That's true. Uh, that's just because I'm so excited about my guest today. And our guest is uh, none other than Trey Ratcliffe. Uh, Trey is the author of uh, World in HDR. Um, he's uh, the the publisher of the number one travel uh, photo blog in the world, without question, which is Stuck at Customs. And uh, we have a lot of things that we're going to be talking about today. But first, let me just say uh, welcome to you, Trey, and thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks, Dane. Um, that was nice of you. This will be fun. Um, thanks very much for the invite. I hope uh, help people get something out of it. I don't want to, you know, just uh, I like let's do some. Uh, Practical pontification. <laughs> okay, I love it. I love it. Well, first off, I get people up to speed. You're you're not at home today. You are you're launching spaceships. What are you What are you doing right now? Yeah, um, uh, NASA invited me out to the space coast here at Cape Canaveral, and uh, I've been out here for almost a week. And uh, you know, the shuttle's been delayed and delayed again. Um, there's no doubt in my mind now that this is a government-run organization. <laughs> and we uh, are going to have uh, uh, a launch sometime in the next few weeks, I think. Um, it's been really sketchy, though. So I've been in and out of the, the press area, uh, spending a lot of time uh, meeting all these other interesting people that showed up for the uh, for the event and going out for coffee and drinks and, and whatnot. So just been uh, spending a lot of hangout time, but using the downtime to get some stuff done, too, I guess. That's great. Now, who, who have you run into that? To connect with, uh, in particular, who are who are some fun well, folks that would be invited to something? All like kinds that. of people. Um, uh, Seth Green and uh, Claire Grant are out here. Uh, they're kind of you know on the celebrity side of things, and they're really big into Twitter. Um, and uh, Lavar Burton is out here. Um, Jordy, hmm. you know, from Star Trek. And uh, we were. I took a photo of the. Um, uh, this big storm was coming in one one day over NASA, mm -hmm. and there's this huge uh, vehicle assembly building where they built the Saturn V rocket, and they, they still use it. So this huge storm is coming in. I'm set out there with my tripod setting up for the shot and uh, taking the shot, and LeVar Burton is there near me. And uh, uh -huh. all of a sudden, this, this uh, gal from NASA, she runs out into the field, and she goes, guys, guys, there's a, a level two lightning alert. You've got to get inside. And then uh, LeVar Burton goes, is that anything like a level three diagnostic? And 
all the nerds just cracked up laughing as she just gave us a sort of dead stare. Um, but another guy I met here who's uh, who's really big into post processing and uh, and uh, video type stuff is Stu Mashewitz, um, pretty famous uh, director from Hollywood, and um, uh, he also makes a lot of uh, apps and stuff like that. And so so we we've gotten along like a house of fire and. And all kinds of interesting people came. A lot of big Twitter type people out at this uh, at this NASA thing. So it's been cool. Hmm, that's great. Um, one second here. I uh, the 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 idea that you would be at a, a, a launching of something like that with S Star Trek people kind of gets me. That that's kind of fun in and of itself. But how in the world did you get invited? Uh, to play a role in that, is there a specific thing that you're doing for them to capture this this launch, or what? Wh how did that whole thing come down? Well, um, when I, it's, I feel very lucky in a way because I understand they had over forty thousand people apply, and they took only a couple hundred. And um, hmm. when I was at South by Southwest, um, one of um, my uh, uh, fans, I, I hate to say, I hate to call them fans, I just kind of. What I like to say is that they're I hear um, friends that I just haven't had the chance to get to know yet. Um, but anyway, so one of these uh, one of these gals, um, her name is Jenny, at Flying Jenny. Uh -huh. She uh, she grabbed me at South by Southwest, and uh, she's been trying to get me to come out to shoot a, a shuttle launch forever. She's head, or she's a major part of the Space Tweep Society, which are all these people at NASA, at JPL, and all over that are are really into um, uh, space exploration and so she uh, she convinced me to come out for this uh, big event and uh, at first I applied for media credentials and uh, they said no uh, because I don't have any print side to uh, to my uh, you know essence or whatever which is of course ridiculous yeah. because yeah, to, to they your, invite uh, to your empire they invite all these people in right they invite all these other people in that uh, all these old school media type people, and I'm not anti old school right. media, but you know, I, I wish at least it was a, a meritocracy. Um, like I ended up sitting right. in the press room at some guy's desk, and it was actually reserved for the guy that uh, that runs like the the Tucson Republic newspaper or whatever, which is fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the Tucson Republic newspaper. Uh, right, but, you know, circulation five hundred. We get about hundred times the traffic as they do. Um, and right, I love this right. stuff, you know. I do it because it's awesome, you know. Um, anyway, so yeah. I ended up getting put on a, a list, and uh, that's that's how it happened. I don't really know. It's very secretive and governmental. God, that's great. Well, you know, a lot of folks are fans of you for for a lot of different reasons. I mean, you've done a lot of things for with with communicating about um, integration of different things artistically and technologically. Uh, your background with with uh, you know the the nitty gritty engineering kinds of stuff, and then also the passion for the art of what you do, all of your travel work, um, the book. But in particular, obviously, you're you're kind of the poster child for all things HDR. And having a chance to hang out a little bit at South by Southwest this year, uh, doing that photo walk, all the photo walks you do all over the, the planet now, um, it just strikes me. And by the way, that was not a Mountain Dew product placement. In case anyone was wondering, he's not also sponsored by Mountain Dew. That would be that's totally different but a lot of folks are interested in uh, this whole idea of HDR and getting involved and especially now that iPhones and uh, other devices like that have now built in so many kind of HDR like capabilities um, the first question out of the gate that I want to get to is it reflects what this guy Arnold uh, Abando is asking and he's simply any advice for someone who wants to get to HDR but doesn't have a budget for a DSLR camera setup pound recession um, and I know you get this kind of question all the time, but for people who want to begin experimenting with HDR, uh, I, obviously you have your very famous tutorial on your blog, but what, what advice would you give to someone like Arnold who wants to get in the game but kind of dip his toe uh, to sort out how they're going to walk through this thing? Sure. Well, you don't, you don't have to have a, a DSLR to make HDR photos. Um, there's a lot of good uh, prosumer you know, kind of high-end consumer cameras that can do it, and all you really need is a, uh, a RAW file. And once you have that RAW file, you can use that to generate a really compelling um, HDR. In fact, I would say maybe uh, 
30% of my HDRs are from a single RAW, but I could do even hmm. more. And uh, there's a, on my website, I list out a few possible cameras. I think one of them, uh, even though I'm a Nikon guy, I think the Canon uh, G11 is sort of a, a, a lower end camera that'll shoot RAW files and you can make an HDR out of those. And you know, new cameras come out all the time. I don't, I'm not really up on all of them, frankly. Um, but a lot of the consumer cameras can do something called auto bracketing, which means that mm -hmm. when you hold down the shutter, it takes uh, multiple photos at different exposures, and that is a, a good component that goes into making an HDR. So you can either make it with a single RAW file or multiple photos at different exposures, and you don't need a DSLR to do that necessarily. Right, that's helpful. Along those lines, uh, it's funny that now the questions are, are beginning to pour in because people are excited about actually taking ground with their or creativity in this regard. But if, if indeed they don't have to uh, go out and spend a ton of dough on, on all that stuff, if they've already spent that money, for example, let's say they, they are professional photographers, they want to um, uh, do more than just take a single raw image and, and start this kind of extended process, and assuming they haven't spent a lot of time at Stuck in Customs, uh, is that the best place to go right out of the gate is just kind of track your tutorial on, on getting in the game? And, and starting from there? Or have there been other resources that you've come across recently that you'd recommend for people to, to leverage the equipment they already have um, to, to really investigate and play with this HDR idea? Well, um, yeah, I would just read my tutorial. I started it about four years ago, and then I go to tighter and cleaner and simpler. Mm -hmm. As I learn new things, I put them into tutorial. And it's really quite easy, even if with just a single RAW file, um, you can be up and running in probably you know 30 minutes, uh, definitely less than an hour, and you'll end up with a photo that will really amaze you. I mean, even though it's your first attempt, and it might be a little bit ham-fisted, um, you'll still be really surprised. And I think hmm. that you'll get enough feedback from those around you that uh, will keep you going, and you'll keep iterating, and you'll keep improving. You're not going to make a masterpiece the first time, but you'll make something that's that's pretty darn mm -hmm. impressive, and you'll start to get the the hints or the shape of great things to come. Now, uh, a lot of the questions that are coming in right now have to do with with HDR, and we're going to get to a handful of those. But you do a lot more than just HDR, and uh, one of the things I've always appreciated about you, Trey, is someone is you're someone who, um, and we've talked about this privately, but this idea of of you are committed to creating all the time it seems like everywhere you go and you're also committed to being a professional obviously you have kids you're you're, you're feeding them keeping a roof over their heads uh, doing some fun adventures along the way and you found a this pretty remarkable way to both go after your creativity artistically and then package that creative art, art, artistry into things that can actually make money uh, but you you've also found a way to to kind of keep them separate. And I'd love it if you could comment a little bit about this this pattern that you were explaining to me that day about the intersection between art and commerce and, and how what your kind of mindset is as you engage, re regardless of what it is, whether it be HDR or or any of the other hosts of different adventures you're in the middle of. What Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy of, of money and art? Sure. There is a, um, a sort of happenstance collision between art and money that's a little bit hard to describe but here's my approach to it um, and I think that in a lot of ways I might be uh, uh, I don't know if I'm an exception or if I'm an outlier or an anomaly in in this uh, in this whole um, diagram um, but it, it's hard to be objective about that but I'll, I'll at least tell you what I do so with me, the, the creativity and the art always comes first. Um, I don't go uh, do something unless I think it's going to be awesome. Um, I have no clients. Uh, nobody ever hires me to do anything. I always say no. And from the beginning, I've always said no. Um, if I want to go take a picture of something, I just go do it. Um, you know, I get the tickets, and arrange the travel, all that stuff myself. Um, like I'm down here at this NASA thing shooting this 
without any commercial hint at all. I give no thought as to whether I might be able to license this photo someday. Um, I don't even think about that. I just go try to uh, you know, surround my life by creating as much awesome art as I can. Um, and I don't always nail it. Um, in fact, I feel like I very rarely nail it, but I do try. And it's that uh, really artistic stimulation that drives me. And then later, you know, at quiet times when I'm, I'm back at home and uh, I have started to uh, create these various assets, uh, then I might take off my artistic hat and put on my business hat and think, okay, is there a smooth way to uh, transition this into a, a money-making asset. And um, if it feels right, if it feels like a, a natural extension of the blog and myself, then I go ahead and do it. So that's why really the blog is 99% free. I know that 99% of the people that come there, they, um, uh, they'll they never put any money in, they'll never buy an ebook, uh, they'll never buy a print, they'll, they'll never do any of that stuff, and that's fine. Um, I think that's perfectly fine because these are all really good people and maybe they're just uh, in a weird economic cycle or whatever or but I know they'll tell their friends about it and they'll appreciate the stuff I'm telling them and I think this is a long relationship you know I think hmm. people that come to the blog I think they'll keep coming for the next 10 or 15 years and something will happen and maybe someday hmm. I'll do something that they they find a, a way to do an economic exchange with it's all right you know it's like you're it's sort of like an extended uh, dinner service, you know, where like I'm a, a waiter or whatever for a, a dinner that goes on for 15 years, and then at the end of it, maybe they'll give me a tip. Uh, mm. But if not, it's okay, you know, we, we still had fun. Um, and then on the other thing about the business side is is that um, uh, we, we do really good with um, licensing uh, the photos. Since I own all the rights to them, um, and since we have so much traffic, um, we end up having a lot of people come to us to license the digital rights to these photos. And uh, we have uh, basically a full-time licensing guy that does nothing but answer uh, licensing emails and, uh, and uh, you know, complete those transactions. So that's, uh, that's all on the business side. We have about uh, nine or ten people at Stuck in Customs uh, that help support the business side. And I set it up that way so that I can just stay uh, purely creative and work on uh, generating content um, and uh, doing things that I think are interesting. And then hmm. I, I do leave the creative side of the business too, like I kind of decide, okay, well, we're going to start trying to sell prints like this. Or, uh, you know, now we're going to start, um, uh, we're going to start building an app that does this because I think this is going to be cool. Um, so I, I do kind of lead the direction, the creative direction in that way, but really it's, it's the whole team here that helps make uh, what you see possible. You really only see the, the tip of the iceberg, and it's, a, it's quite an operation we have here. You know, you absolutely, and, and it's interesting as I've gotten to know you a little bit and hearing some of the different avenues that you've played out, it seems like so much of it, it, it the, with the fruit you're ben you, that you're enjoying, and that, that we all get to benefit from is because you've structured your whole business with this kind of blog centric where you put a ton of commitment into your Stuck in Customs blog and you've run everything through that space. Um, but this idea of creativity first, commerce second, putting a whole bunch of value out into this, to the world for people to engage in and, and play with and get value from, to lead with that and then to do the kind of pretty pretty courageous thing it seems to me from the outside looking in and and committing to um, adding value before you uh, look to withdraw you know money from the economy um, that it seems like you've kind of written your own ticket and I, I do appreciate that you're saying you know maybe I'm an outlier kind of I do it odd there's certainly I don't know many people who do it that way but as since we've had that conversation a number of weeks ago it's stuck in my mind as as something that I've taken away and, and I'm actively trying to rearrange my life because uh, so much of that is infrastructure and a lot of the photographers that I, I talk with they tend to they're like they're like like I've been where I I kind of get um, handcuffed or lassoed into um, a structure of my business that necessitates that I trade a lot of my time in for money uh, that I don't do anything to scale and it seems like you've been pretty methodical on how you built this whole thing out um, is that is that fair to say that that's that the structure was pretty intentional 
uh, and and that's why you've you you've been able to do this, uh, or is that a myth? Well, there have been a few, um, I think, fundamental foundational principles that were there from the beginning, and that was sort of the idea that I was never going to do any client work, and that I fully intended uh, for 99% of the content I create to be freely consumed and shared on the internet. Hmm. Um, so that that was something uh, that was uh, uh, planned. Really, everything else you see uh, may look like it's uh, the some part of a, a master plan, but it really isn't. Uh -huh. I think with anything uh -huh. else, whether it's whether it's building your art or whether it's building your business, is it's an iterative process in which you mm. try a lot of different things, you make a lot of mistakes, you forgive yourself for the mistakes because they're really <laughs> honest mistakes. Because uh, sometimes you really don't know, you know, um, you just really, really don't know. And we do live in a world now where we get immediate feedback on everything from our art yes, to we do. our business ideas. And, yeah. um, you know, as long as you, you haven't uh, done anything for the wrong reason, people people forgive you pretty fast. And also the nature of the blog is that it's so personal and that I share my personal mm -hmm. thoughts and, and um, you know, I don't, I'm not like this, uh, you know, you know, 14-year-old histrionic girl that's that's uh, just way off into her own psyche. You know, um, I, uh -huh. I but I do share my thoughts, and in in a way, what happens is as I make myself more vulnerable and uh, put more of myself and my thoughts and my art online, what it does is it hmm. creates this kind of reverse filter, where people get auto filtered into my world. Right? We have this, can we, have, we think of filters like spam filters as getting the crap out, right? So that you can just concentrate on the good. But by having this very personal blog as sort of the, the main ship that I'm on, what happens is that um, we end up with hundreds of thousands of people around the world that just kind of gel with what I have to say for whatever reason. And then when I meet people like at this event or any other event, when people come up to me, they're always so nice. Um, and they've been auto filtered mm. into my world, so we don't even have to try to become friends. It's just like automatic friendship, mm. you know. And so um, mm. uh, that makes it also easy. Um, uh, on the other end, because it's, what I do is totally transparent. And if you like it, mm -hmm. then you're kind of part of this world, and I'm part of your world, mm -hmm. and we get as much as we give. And I really, you know, and anyone in in my kind of position, and in your kind of position, and a lot of other these other people, they'll tell you that. Um, yeah, that I get as much out of their feedback that they appear to get from me giving them things. So it's this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's this energy, and I've spent so much of my life um, stuck in situations where there's just like a, a bit of uh, you know energy or people that drain you, or uh, you know people that just want to suck off your mojo for whatever reason. And this. Uh, uh, did you, you just know, say none, none suck of off your mojo? Did, um, did you just say suck off your mojo? Yeah. Is that what I heard you that's say? That's right. <laughs> just want to be clear. That's right. We all have a certain amount of mojo, and you don't need it to be. Uh, you know, you, you gotta you gotta keep it going and have it be uh, have it be reinforced by those people around you. And so, by having kind of a personal blog that's combined with sort of my my artistic um, uh, sort of my this artistic train that I'm on, and you know, it changes every every few months wherever I'm at in my own little um, artistic um, struggle or whatever you want to call it. That seems too dramatic to call it a struggle, uh, but it's nice to have all these people kind of with me, and not just with me as voyeurs, but they're going through this stuff too. And right. um, it, it seems like a very natural evolution of, of everything. Now, uh, you mentioned early on that. Um, from the outside looking in, and especially in retrospect, it can look like all the things that you've been creating have been like this master plan where it all came together. And, and I actually really appreciate your candor that that's rarely, if ever, the case. In fact, most of the folks that I've had a chance to bump into and get in this conversation with uh, who've, who've done at the scope the kind of the things that you've done, they say the same kind of thing over and over again, that this really a you know, you're grateful looking back, but it's it's a lot cleaner in retrospect than it is in process. And I have a hunch that a lot of the folks who are watching right now are 
are saying to themselves, okay, that's all great for at Trey Radcliffe, who has a gazillion people who go to stuckincustoms.com every day. <laughs> but what about for a, a joker like me, who, um, this is like, like maybe maybe they're they're professional photographers in one genre and they want to make the jump to travel photographer for example that's what sean reed asks is do you have an advice for photographers who want to make the jump to travel but but to not I, we can address that question if you want but the bigger thing that i'm curious about is when you think about your first travel photo destination uh or if you're in the shoes of someone who's just kind of getting into some new genre of creativity um and you came up with a question of of how do I do I take the risk early on and and finance this thing myself or 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 throw myself in that position the first question is did you actually do that at the beginning did you actually finance your early travels on your own and then second if you were starting out over again and you didn't have this wide net of audience um, with this perception of this you know empire um, and you, ha you actually have created a pretty amazing empire but if you were starting out knowing what you know now would you do those same kinds of risks of investing in your own stuff and and you know owning your content and, and moving in that direction um so that's a loaded couple questions in there but i'm wondering if you could just give some commentary sure well um early on um i took trips uh for business for another thing i was with and mm -hmm. i would spend time on the weekends and kind of finance the weekend bit myself um, like if I happen to be in, um, I don't know, uh, Amsterdam, uh, I might stay a few extra days and go out and shoot photos. And this was many, many years ago. And that was when I was still kind of getting my artistic feet under me. And I don't, like, I don't even like any of my uh, Amsterdam photos anymore. And even back then, nobody was really on the blog. Um, and then uh, really for the past, uh, you know, several years, I've been financing everything myself. Um, and hmm. uh, that's when the blog really started doing well um, financially because um, you know it is it is kind of a expensive proposition to go out and, and do this stuff but that's right um, I think the larger question is that um, uh, and here's sort of the here's the important notion is that um, and I can sense that people don't people do want to go out and take photos and, and own their own um, uh, you know raison d'etre or whatever you want to call it but mm -hmm. this idea that people also want to become um, creative and kind of find their artistic niche at the same time that they're they're going through this left brain world this is a very difficult uh, balance to achieve and this is to me one of the most interesting conversations is how do you uh, mm. you know how do you keep going coming uh, more and more of an artistic and fulfilled person in sort of a, a natural way that, that feels right. And mm. here we all are, right, where it's 2011 or whatever, we're, we're all on Twitter and we feel like it's a very mature market, right? We feel like, oh, you know, whatever, Trey has X followers and Dane has X followers and, and so on, so on and so forth. And, but we're, we're way mm -hmm. too caught up in this, this is really nonsense. Um, it is. It's not nonsense. In, it's only nonsense insofar as it's just the beginning, right? And uh, don't feel like this is a mature uh, place and it's too late for you and your blog will never get popular. Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Because this is just collaborative. Way. And, you know, of the six billion. Hardly any of them are into this stuff that we're into. We're all in the bubble, so we have no perspective on it. But really, over the next five to ten That's years, right. there's going to be explosive growth. And even if you're watching this, you know, even if you know who we are, then you're already getting a little bit of a, a hint of things to come. This is totally the beginning. Right. There's plenty of white space. There's plenty of room for all of us to grow. I'm convinced hmm. that there is no finite amount of attention. Right. Just because I have a ton of followers does it mean that that other people can't also um, mm. so really this is just the beginning there's plenty of time uh, for for many many people to have success and as you're just beginning this sort of um, this kind of inchoate um, life of art and business and mm. blogging or whatever you wh however you you choose to balance it it is important to go into it with a certain set of premises 
that are kind of um, ideologically pure and that you have a little bit of a plan and that you're not uh, don't go into it with a sense of desperation don't let fear of loss motivate you uh, don't let money over motivate you um, Mm -hmm. uh, if you can go into it, you've got plenty of time. You know, I, the blog's been up for five or six years. The first half of that, no one even looked at the darn thing. It was just me and my mom. <laughs> right now, it's super popular. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, right. but really, there it it looks like. So right now, we have every day we get um, 175,000 photo views per day. Hmm. Now, that seems like a lot, right? Uh, but, um, and that might feel totally unachievable to uh, other people that are watching, uh, depending on your level, you, maybe you're not that far from that, I don't know. But um, really, in five or ten years, you can be hitting that too, right? It just takes a long time and you'll get there. Just remember, there's hardly any eye eyeballs uh, directed at the kind of stuff that we're doing, right? But the internet is becoming this incredible cultural phenomenon into this culture and so it's our work that will be uh, the eye candy for these billions of people that are soon to come online yeah well it's it's uh there, there's so much in what you're saying because on the front end structure on how you're going to get into putting your your creativity to the world and based on that structure, you know, you and your mom, you show up, you, you create the content, uh, you put it up there. No one is paying attention to it at the beginning, just like everybody who started anything, that's always the case. And along the way, you might get some breaks, you might have some challenges, but you're creating good content and you're taking that content and the creation of it very seriously. Uh, a week or so ago, we had a, an author who's not a, a professional photographer, is a photographer, but great guy, his name is CeCe Chapman who wrote a book called Content Rules, and it was basically just him and Ann Handley over at, at Marketing Profs. They wrote this great book on, on taking their creation of content seriously enough that it's, it's pro-grade, that it, it really is interesting to folks. And regardless of how many people are reading it or watching it or engaging it, it the, the point is to commit to creating the great stuff. So it sounds like you've, you've set that up as your primary kind of first rule and then from there, you've just made it easier and easier for people to want to participate. Um, so much so that, I mean, what I'm amazed by is you have this abundant worldview. Like um, another guy uh, who I know you and I both know, uh, David Duchemin, who uh, had a pretty devastating accident over the last couple of weeks where he, he was taking a picture over, over in Europe and he fell and he's, he's all beat up in a hospital and he's fine. He's going to recover, but he's going to have a rough go for the next number of months. But I know we are talking about how you write and uh, encourage um, the reading of, of ebooks. So if people don't go out and buy the hardcover of this, they could go to flatbooks.com and, and get access to a ton of great resources that you're putting out there. And then on that very site, you have a link to uh, Craft and Vision, which is all of David Duchemin's uh, work. Uh, and his his ebooks, right. and in my mind, that's, su that's such a great example of actually showing people that you believe in um, the idea of of there's a lot of market available if you create great stuff and make it easy for people to access it. Um, and it's funny when I first saw that and saw the links, and this is a long-winded commentary here, but what I was amazed by, I actually thought, gosh, I wonder in in my work as a photographer when I shoot weddings. I know stylistically there's a kind of wedding that I always want to shoot and every time uh, or a portrait session or whatever I wonder if I would ever be courageous enough to actually put links on my site to other photographers who I had esteem for who maybe shot stylistically something different or I wonder if if I could be collaborative at a level that was was so uncommon that I created value just by giving resource and filtering for other people. Would you actually take your worldview to that kind of an extent? I know you already have with Flatbooks, but or is there is there nuance to that that you want to consider um, as to how you encourage and promote and and hold up great work that might be seen as competitive? Well, it's uh, it's not um, it's not competitive when everybody wins. And hmm. what happens with uh, today's um, today's tools that allow us to uh, splice our attention? Um, everybody can win, 
And for example, you know, if you think back, I can barely remember what it was like to be on the internet before tabbed browsing, right? Hmm. And now I've got, you know, tons of tabs open all the time like everybody else. And basically what this means is that you your brain is evolving at a pretty quick rate the more and more you use the internet and you're able to have uh, a lot more attention. And I I it's hard to be really objective about this, but when I was, you know, you know younger, even in my 20s, I'm I'm 39 now. My late twenties, the internet started getting bigger and bigger, and so on and so forth. But I think I just paid attention to less things then. Now I pay attention hmm. to more things, and there is a soft balance between paying attention to too much and information overload and this kind of stuff. But over time, I think we have come to understand that by using Twitter, if you use it in the right way, and you you know follow. A, a, I don't know what the magic number is. It's probably something like three to seven hundred people. I don't, I don't know. But if you really take time mm -hmm. to curate who you choose to follow, you start carving off people that um, that are just you know tweeting nonsense. Uh, but then you know it, as you start to uh, curate who you really want to pay attention to, you can pay attention to a lot of very stimulating things at the same time. And so just like with flatbooks.com. Uh, we definitely put a link there to craftandvision.com, David's thing, because he has great ebooks, and I know in my heart of hearts that that uh, uh, photographers that are interested in knowledge, they will buy a bunch of different ebooks. I mean, these things are only five or ten or twenty dollars; they cost nothing. And so you can, uh, you know, that scene in The Matrix when he realizes he can learn uh, kung fu, right? All he does is he keeps learning uh -huh. more and more and more stuff. Because it's so easy, it's it's you know ten dollars. That's like three lattes. It's it's hardly anything. And the idea that you can get this incredibly refined, uh, amazing knowledge compressed into a little fifty-page ebook, right, without all the nonsense mm -hmm. that goes into a normal three hundred-page book. That's one of the great uh, you know lies of traditional publishing is that most mm -hmm. publishers or most authors will fill a book with a bunch of nonsense just to make it thick enough. To be deserving of the, a thirty-dollar uh, <laughs> shelf fee, which is absurd. Um, so anyway, right. the other aspect of where we do this is on um, HDRSpotting.com, which is a site I started with a friend. Uh, any uh, other great HDR photographers out there? Um, I started that site because I would go look at some of my friends' photos, or even just people that I stumbled upon and they had this beautiful HDR photo and it might only have like 30 views or like 110 views and I thought that's not right um, this is a really high quality photo and I figured the problem was not with the photo the problem was, was not with the photographer but the problem was with um, the internet was not properly distributing attention so that's why HDR spotting kind of runs on this thing we call an attention generation engine and so now people that get their stuff into HDRSpotting.com, um, you know, they get uh, hundreds or thousands, sometimes uh, tens of thousands of views on their photos. And that they're interested in this stuff, they'll look at my stuff and they'll look at these other people's stuff. And it doesn't, uh, it, we all win. And uh, so there is no competition, I don't think anymore, because hmm. Hmm. there's, there's uh, we can all win. Hmm. I love that on a number of fronts, and and I, obviously there's nuance and language here. But this idea, I mean, obviously, in if I'm a wedding photographer in Orange County, California, there's a lot of really remarkable wedding photographers in Orange County, California, who I am indeed in competition with for a particular job. But at the same time, I like what you're saying because if indeed it's not about one mode of creativity, but there's there could be several modes of creativity that could be turned into commerce if it need be, and if not then it could just be a form of expression and that's sufficient. Um, that actually that competition is refining in such a way that I actually get better at my work. And it brings to mind actually a question that Jennifer McKevitt asks. She says, um, would you say it's important to create work without others in mind and for it to find its own fame? Uh, how, would you, how would you respond to that kind of a question? Well, yes, I think that you uh, you have to get out of this photography bubble um, because hmm. um, I find that people really too often 
try to impress other photographers. And other photographers should be the last people you need to impress. Really, who cares what they think? Mm. Who, care, who cares what I think? And I, I see this a lot because so many people send me their work to look at or to critique or whatever. Uh, they really want um, my approval or something. And I think that there's something a little bit flawed in that. In that, don't it, your um, your motivation should just be to create things that you think are interesting, and keep iterating on that. And add, if you come up with two things that are interesting choose the one that is the most interesting and put that one out there. In this process hmm. of working somewhat in a vacuum, somewhat within your own brain, you can make something totally unique and something that's your own because every one of us, no matter how old you are, if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, you bring your own very personal lifetime of experience into this, right? You have your own family history, you have your own educational history, uh, you have many adventures that you've been on, you've had lots of trauma in your life, You've had all kinds of, a very, whatever you've been through is incredibly unique to you. And that can be the, uh, the, the genesis and the nexus of all your creative stuff. Now, if you start taking your work and putting it on Flickr and um, overvaluing the feedback you get on there and trying to please everybody, trying to get as many people to like it as possible, then your work will end up being sort of um, designed by committee. And I like to say that's why you never see a hmm. statue of a committee. And the hmm. bad thing about Flickr is that everybody's uh, feedback is equally valued, right? And you can't tell the difference between someone that really knows what they're talking about and a total moron. They all have equal <laughs> weighting. And uh, it's, uh, hmm. it's kind of a shame because there's so many um, interesting young photographers that may be taking too much out of that Flickr feedback. And part of the problem mm -hmm. too is, is that when you show your work to other photographers, when they look at it, they look at it through their own lens, so to speak. And they bring to your photo whatever baggage that they have laden themselves with over the years. So um, really, it's it's not always the most valuable feedback on, on Flickr. And you should be totally independent and do it on your own. And uh, mm. insofar as other people like it, that's that's great. Um, but you'll mm. you know, you don't uh, you don't find yourself through this process. You you create yourself through this process. Hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, th and there's so many directions to go with all these conversations. I want to be respectful of your time, as well, because we've already gone a little over time. But there are a couple more questions that I want to address. Uh, one is from my friend Tamara Lackey, who's on the line, and. Um, Tamara asks the question, has the act of traveling exacerbated your sense of creativity or sometimes worn it down or both? And I think it's a really interesting question because it, it does seem like, <coughs> excuse me, in your interest of putting yourself out there, owning your work, creating new work, uh, do you ever just get tired? <laughs> does it ever, does the act of trying to be creative wear down your creativity or does it kind of um, regenerate itself uh, through the process for you? Well, um, no, I I never um, I never get tired of uh, of traveling, and I never have a um, uh, I have yet to have sort of a, a a writer's block, whatever the equivalent is for photographers. Uh, there should be a word for that. Uh, but um, but no, the thing is with travel is that. Um, uh, once you open yourself up and you're not motivated by the fear of not knowing what's going on because that I mean that can be sort of an overpowering thing if you let if you let this fear occupy 51 percent of your brain uh, about all the things that could go wrong when you travel or getting lost or not being able to find your way back to the hotel or or uh, you know if you let the, or getting robbed or you know th this kind of stuff can uh, be a little bit insane by brain, um, but if you can get or choose to ignore that actively, it gets this super overstimulated, artistic, um, incredible amounts of stimulation. Because I think as as photographers and artists, we're already predisposed to being the types of personalities that need a massive amount of stimulation. Times. And there's nothing more stimulating 
than going someplace else and seeing how they do it differently. Whether it's something as simple as a market that's selling fruit, you know, the shape and color of the fruit. It's so strange to your brain that you can't help being on full alert all the time. It's not just the color and shape of the fruit in this foreign land, it's anything. You know, it's the way they, it's the topography on the signs for the dentist office. It's, it's you know, the way that the curbs are shaped compared to the way you're used to seeing all other curbs shaped. I mean, you can look at anything. And um, it's extremely stimulating. And I think that kind of new stuff coming into your brain all the time is wonderful because you have your own unique prism that you've shaped over time through, uh, through your own personal experience. And what goes through that prism, you'll be able to interpret in your own way. And so I think this, this kind of uh, exposing yourself to new stuff all the time is very important. Hmm. Uh, any, any thoughts on the future of, of HDR in general? I know, oh, actually, let me ask this question before that one. Uh, April asked this question in the chat room, and she graciously added it to the uh, light bulb area. So she says, um, how has success... Uh, and a busier schedule affected your creativity compared to the early days when it was just you and your mom checking out your blog. Uh, ha has has your just kind of sheer busyness shut it down at all? Well, um, I am incredibly busy, but I'm busy of my own making, which is the good the good kind of busy. Um, you know, it's stress, but it's the good kind of stress that drives you forward. Um, and I've always got this huge, healthy list of to-dos, um, hmm. and uh, I think it's it's great. The only thing that's that's happened is that now the uh, the kind of choices I make are I have more and better choices to make than I used to, um, because hmm. the blog has gotten popular, so on and so forth. I do have um, wonderful invitations all over the world, all the time to go do amazing hmm. things, and so now it's just sort of a matter of. Um, scheduling them and planning them and making them happen um, but these are all you know well, that, uh, what we call that high seems grade like just, problems uh, I'm not uh, yeah. well sure but these all these all these things these conditions that you're describing seem to be uh, outflows of intention like you decided that your life you wanted to be this kind of way you decided that you wanted to build your creativity and own your work and and set that out and that's all those ideas are entirely available to anyone listening to this call if I'm hearing you right that that indeed um, regardless of how many people are viewing right now if you decide your value set and you live that out and you because the tools that are available to everybody right now are they are ubiquitous we actually can do this and what I'm hearing you say is you're kind of almost giving permission for other people to do it and by the way you're doing this every day and by the way so am I and so are other people in this line like uh, uh, our mutual friend uh, Becker is on the line, I know, and he asked a question around, uh, here it is here, Trey, can you share a little bit about Burning Man and how that inspires you create creatively? Uh, and I, I love this question because I know Becker goes to Burning Man, he's, he's asked me to come out a couple of years, I might actually head out soon and I'd like to, uh, but I know you have a very unique perspective on Burning Man as a, um, as a creative uh, input I guess and I want to hear you to say about it but the fact that you can even entertain this possibility I think a lot of folks are at home and they're thinking first off I don't know what Burning Man is but even if I did I would never be able to carve out time in my life to go do something like that um, but that's not your approach at all uh, so talk a little bit about Burning Man and and what it means to you and, and how you how you address it yeah so for people that don't know Burning Man is a big yearly celebration in the desert in Nevada in the summer, late summer, and um, I don't know, something like 50, 60,000 people go set up out in the desert with, in camps in a semi-organized way, and uh, you basically just hang out for a week, um, and then you break everything down and you go back home. And so I, I don't know, uh, I, I don't really fit into any of the three main groups there, and that's fine. Um, I think the three main groups that go are, are the hippies, uh, the the druggies and the ravers, okay. And sometimes these last two, uh -huh. are, there's a lot of Venn diagram overlap in those two. Now, so I'm not really <laughs> any of those. Um, I, I'm just kind of an uh, uh, artistic guy that that likes and needs a lot of stimulation at all times. And um, there's something very unusual there. Um, and this wasn't what I anticipated. This was my first year going, and um, I'm already not really a, 
a judgmental person. You know, I'm kind of very laid back. Whatever people want to do is fine. Um, you know, I don't really care as long as they, you know, have good intentions and aren't really bothering anybody. It's fine. But I know that not everybody is like that. So even though I have that attitude as I go through the real world, I'm surrounded by people that are not like that. So I kind of live in this hinterland between uh, uh, people that have an artistic way of life and those that are stuck in the matrix. And so hmm. what happens is when you go to Burning Man, very quickly you realize that nobody there is judgmental. Nobody cares. It's, you know, anything goes. And this is kind of incredibly liberating because as you walk around with your camera and you're seeing all this stuff you never even thought of before, you're just seeing weird costumes and open people and you're seeing all these uh, amazing structures that people have built, incredible vehicles rolling around the desert at 2 a.m. Um, it's just like nothing you've ever seen or thought of or even envisioned. And this kind of totally unique um, visual input that's coming in uh, while you're in the middle of this non-judgmental kind of milieu, it's uh, very stimulating in an unexpected way. Hmm. hmm. So, um, when you're in that kind of an environment and uh, you're you're getting that input and you're thinking through what what when you went to Burning Man last year for the first time and now you're a year later and you're thinking about going back again, what, what um, knowing what you know now, how would you approach this kind of new stimuli in a way that you can be creative out of it? Uh, what, what is your mindset going into an event like Burning Man? Well, um, last year I went into it and walked around a few days without my camera really, just kind of experiencing it, trying to get the feel of it before trying to shoot it. And it's, it is a very tough, you know, technically a very tough shooting environment. Um, I won't I won't go into all the technical stuff. Um, I, I'll just talk about the artistic side. Um, but uh, uh, by the way, you should not use your main camera at Burning Man. Just use a backup camera or um, an older camera because you you know you can still take take good photos with that old thing, right? So don't don't take your new stuff. Um, uh, you know, pretty much everybody is in costume, right? And if you're not in costume, then you're the odd guy out. Um, so I had uh, these really um, cool steampunk glasses that I got off of Etsy with these big gears and stuff on them, but they had this sort of orange tint on them. And so I wore those everywhere, and everywhere I went, I sort of had this um, orange, very gritty, dirty tint, because my glasses were always dirty. So I was basically always seeing a lot of noise and and uh, everything was sort of this desaturated, strange thing. I could see reds really brightly, but that was kind of the only color, reds and oranges. And so anyway, I decided to go around and take photos, and then I created a, a Lightroom filter. And I basically ran through that filter that had a lot of noise and kind of brought in these tones. And then it all actually looked like I actually saw it. And that was kind of the, hmm. uh, the photos that emerged from that experience. And they kind of had a nice, a nice feel to them. I love that. Hey, uh, I, I really have gone over time with you, and I apologize, but it's only because this is stimulating. And I want to uh, invite you down the line. Is there any chance we could get back again? Because there's al already a ton of questions that people aren't going to get to, a lot of HDR questions in the future of HDR. Um, and uh, first off, just thanks for being on. Second, I want to get you back if you'll ever come back. And then um, uh, third, any parting comments about kind of trajectory of, of uh, where you see technology taking us and opportunities coming down the line. I know that there's a really interesting book uh, that um, uh, Kevin Kelly just wrote on on what technology wants. And I actually thought of you relative to that book because it seems like you're a bit of a futurist too. You're always thinking about where are things going and how can you grab things and make new things out of them. So wondering if you comment on all three of those. One, thanks for coming. Two, uh, yeah. will you come back again? And three, what do you think of the future? Well, I like how you uh, um, conversationally corner me into saying, yes, I will come back again. But I would. I, <laughs> I would come back. Uh, no problem. Uh, it yeah, Kevin Kelly is great. Um, I have a whole uh, reading list on my website of, um, of topics and, you know, that are orthogonal to uh, photography. But I think, 
I really believe in sort of a holistic approach to uh, photography and the more kind of um, science and other cultural stuff that feeds into it, the more it'll feed your photography. But so Kevin Kelly and this futurism stuff is very interesting to me. And I kind of have my own take on it because I, I do produce so much um, uh, digital um, content imagery for the internet, right? And uh, this is part of my impetus. I'm, I'm uh, going to get one of these um, epic uh, red cameras. Um, hmm. And uh, uh, insofar as I think that the internet um, wants more and more rich content, and we are in this um, sea of information. And in a sea of information, people look for islands of meaning. And I love the idea of, you know, grabbing as much data as possible and then organizing that data into something meaningful and then delivering that data to the internet. And so um, this process of gathering the data. Uh, and organizing the data and delivering the data. This is kind of the alpha to omega of my existence. And so that's why on the alpha side, I'm starting to uh, increase the amount of, uh, you know, raw gigabytes that I'm capturing in the world around us uh, so that I can organize it in a more robust way and then deliver a, a, a better, more organized set of, um, of assets to the internet itself. Hmm. Um, so that's sort of a high level around the, the, the meta idea of uh, content hmm. and the internet. Hmm. Well, there's a lot embedded in what you're saying because, again, if folks are listening, if they're yours to hear, you're, you're kind of on, on many levels giving uh, not only clues as to the direction you're going technologically with you know the equipment you're grabbing, but also like the red camera and stuff, but also what what is the meta story that's driving what you're interested in and it sounds like on some level even some prescription for other folks to investigate what could they be doing uh, to create content that would collaborate with or kind of be co be very hospitable or palatable in the technological conversation because you're right if Kevin Kelly is right and I think he's more right than wrong although he's tough to hang with because he's so brilliant um, it seems like the kinds of content that's going to be coming down the line 10 years from now will be qualitatively more mature and advanced than what's been done historically. And if folks are just kind of regurgitating stuff that's already been done, it's not going to be nearly as as uh, potent as as what, what you're describing, the new stuff that you want to go out and, and go make. And I think that's why it's very exciting. And, and, and honestly, I, I do feel bad that I cornered you into saying you come back. And if we get offline, you decide not to come back. No harm, no foul. But uh, I, I just so appreciate uh, that that wisdom because I actually, as I consider my own work and my friends in the industry, what we need to be doing, we really do need to raise the bar in our creativity and our content. And it's not going to be enough to just look at what other people are doing and emulate it. And I just, uh, I so appreciate all the leadership that you bring to the table in that. And, and thank you uh, for for all the places you're, you're taking us. Um, I'm I'm learning a ton. And by the way, I do know you have a you have an event coming up soon that I want to make sure people are aware of. It's the um, your photography webinar, uh, and I have a link here. Is it just stuckincustoms.com forward slash webinar? Yes, that's right. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put that in the uh, in the chat room for you guys if you want to check it out. Um, and if you're watching this on the replay, go ahead and check out stuckincustoms.com forward slash webinar. Uh,